Thanks for joining us. Enormous crowd of people. Uh, my name's Tasha Finney. I'm the a senior lecturer here in the School of Architecture and I coordinate the lecture series. Um, just before I introduce our speaker, can I uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Um, we are incredibly fortunate tonight to have Anna Katrine Honeman here speaking to us from Blue Bakery. Blue Bakery is a multidisciplinary design and urbanism agency that started in 2006. Um, they're Danish. Um, Anna Katrine's here as part of the uh, residency at the Droga, the Droga residency with the Institute of Architects. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing more about the work. Thank you. Is that working now? Okay. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to come here. So, um, yeah, um, I thought uh, we were just discussing, is it on? It seems like it's okay, yeah, all right. So, uh, as Tasha said, I, I come from Denmark and um, I'm educated as an architect and urban planner and uh, I want to talk a little bit about this theme, co-creating the city. Um, and I thought that I would just uh, start off with just a short introduction of what Blue Bakery is about and, and what we do. And then I would just sort of give a, a flashback more historically uh, about the premises uh, for the Danish society and the welfare state because that is actually sort of um, the framework for how we, we work today in Denmark with uh, this co-creative approach. And then in the end, I will uh, sum up with showing you some uh, recent cases from Denmark. I have about five that we can sort of look into and then hopefully we can sort of have a discussion. And you're very happy to sort of uh, have questions. We can take them along the way, I think, so we sort of, you know, if you, if you would like to get involved here. All right, but um, I think I will just start with this uh, proverb. Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I'll understand. Because I think this very much sums up uh, my approach to architecture and my approach to urban planning. Um, I just remember that uh, some weeks ago, I heard Graham Young at this uh, uh, lecture, the, fourth, uh, the 20th anniversary at the MAP, and he started saying that they're architects and they're urban planners, and you can tell the difference uh, by the presentations. So the one without any people, that's architects, and the ones that has the people in it, uh, they're urban planners. So uh, you will see a lot of people in my presentation, so I reckon I must be an urban planner. But, uh, as I said, I was um, educated as an architect and um, in Aarhus, uh, the second biggest city in Denmark, at the School of Architecture there. And um, for the last uh, 15 years, I've been working with uh, co-creative uh, processes and participatory design within urban planning. And um, since I was educated, uh, I was co-founder of No Architecture no architects who, who are actually here now in this residency, the Droga Architects Residency. And uh, then I've been for several years on the other side of the table as, uh, as a municipal client uh, for a huge uh, development area outside Copenhagen. And I was there for four years, uh, sort of, um, you know, steering the process and, and kickstarting the whole development as a project developer. And then since 2006, uh, I have been running this small office called Blue Bakery, um, and that's what I'm still doing. Um, and basically what we do is uh, urban strategies, we do uh, development plans, and we do a lot of stakeholder involvement. So that's like citizens, it's organizations, it's decision making, developers, you know, all kind of people who would actually like or have an interest in being part of the whole development process. Um, and then we do these uh, kickstarting activities, often in the pre-phase, uh, the pre-planning pre phase, 
uh, that could be all kind of events or activities that sort of gather people and also make a large focus on what is actually going to happen in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. So that's what we do. Um, so I reckon uh, urban planning is really taking a, a, a lot of different skills, professional skills and a lot of different knowledge. So that's why I organized Blue Bakery in the way that actually I'm the only architect and urban planner there. But then um, we have uh, one who's uh, very good at strategic communication and the graphic designer, filmmaker, cultural producer and event maker for these uh, happenings that are just so and a creative entrepreneur. And they're all independent uh, consultants, senior consultants, and then this actually creates us quite a, a flexible framework so we can sort of set the team for every assignment we, we sort of involve, we're getting involved in. So that's how we work. Um, and then I will just tell a little bit about Denmark. So some of you might have been there. It's a very small country. It's like 5.5 million inhabitants. It's like Sydney, I guess. Um, and it's part of, of the, the Nordic region, so you have uh, Norway and Sweden and Finland and Denmark is this part, and here you have Copenhagen. And um, the country is divided like organizational or politically in five regions, and in there you can say within the, within the country we have the same issues as we see everywhere in Globally, like people are moving to the to the big cities, so the four big cities are getting a lot of a lot of people moving there, and the consequence is, of course, that it empties out on on the suburban and the out um, what do you call it, like the the outskirts of the country. So that's the tendency. So we have at the moment 85 percent are living in in closer urbanized areas and 50% are living out in the country in the countryside and this gives like very two very different um, situation of working with uh, urbanization uh, due to which municipality uh, you actually are working in because the municipalities that have the greater the greater cities like this one and the Cope the larger Copenhagen and Aarhus as well. Um, they don't have a problem in attracting people because people are already there. So it's another issue they have to work with when they work with co-creative processes. And then the rest of the country where people are sort of moving away, schools are closing down, shops are closing down, it's another issue. So for the last five years we have had this discussion um, and it's um, it's named within the media as the rotten banana. <laughs> it's, it's the outskirts of, of Denmark. But uh, you know, actually people are living out there. And if you live there, it's not nice that you sort of are stated that you live in a rotten banana. So they're, they're sort of fighting against it and saying, well, it might be that everything is closing down here. But we actually have a huge force of entrepreneurs and innovation that can actually happen out here due to, due to other factors. And I will come back to that. So we have this fight between the green cu cu cucumber and, and the rotten banana. Um, and for the last, uh, I think the last year, maybe two years, there's a lot of focus on how we can actually uh, turn this situation into a, a new, um, a new um, like starting point for, for making innovation out in, in, in the outskirts. So here you see the four largest cities of Copenhagen, our capital is 1.5 million. And, and as I said, in this case where you have a lot of people living, the, 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 the quest is to sort of how can they involve themselves in all these public spaces, public domains and urban uh, areas. Whereas in, in the outskirts, it's another situation that's very much about engaging people in just keeping the basic service services and uh, and making the life quality you know good so people don't move away. So um, I will just run through a little bit uh, more historically where this uh, approach um, in terms of the Danish settings um, is, is coming from. 
And this is the model that uh, has been very present for the last 100 years in Denmark. It's the Scandinavian welfare state. And, uh, and contrary to here, the public sector is really huge in Denmark. So the public sector is sort of the major client in the built environment. So they uh, build everything like institutions, parks, uh, infrastructure. And, uh, and then, of course, they sort of deliver that kind of service to the civil society in collaboration with the private sector. So that's basically how it works. And uh, until 1849, we had a, a monarchy. And then we had a new constitution. And you can say the first kind of democracy was formed in 1849. But um, it was also like this one, let's say, democracy for the few selected. It was only 15% at that time that had the right to vote, which was the unpunished punished men, self-supporting men over 30, while all of criminals, fools, and poor people and strangers, of course, couldn't sort of be part of this um, gang. So um, that was at that time. But now, today, we have this uh, constitutional monarchy, which basically means that we have a monarchy as a, they represent Denmark, but we have this democratically elected government. And some of you probably know Mary from Tasmania. She's very loved in Denmark. So we have a democracy. We have a parliament with nine parties. Um, and you would probably think, I mean, we have left and, and right wing parties, but I think compared to many other countries, you could basically say that they're all in the middle. There's not that big difference between the liberal and, and the social democrats. Um, so at the moment, we have a social uh, prime minister, social democratic uh, prime minister, Helle Thorning, which is also the first lady uh, or the first woman as a uh, as So basically, this whole welfare state is a so social democratic project. And also due to these uh, small differences between the liberal and the social democratic, it means that we have actually, for the last 100 years, have had very stable uh, political situation. Um, you know, there hasn't been that large shift where everything is just sort of stable and you have to start a new plan. So this has been like the major project for the last 100 years in Denmark. It was basically uh, very social in the way that it was a, an attempt to sort of uh, make the living standards in general uh, uh, higher for, for everybody in, in Denmark, including education, housing, and so forth. Um, and especially with the cooperative movement, which came around the 1900, um, uh, people, is especially like small farmers, started to organize themselves in new cooperative, especially in the diary industry. Um, because by organizing themselves uh, in, within larger unions, they could actually uh, sort of um, uh, profit much more from their products. They could bring all the milk to this diary and then quite quickly and within a short time it would be on the market. So they sort of uh, lifted the whole production um, also internationally. And actually today, one of Ala, our largest, uh, maybe some of you know this uh, huge Danish uh, uh, milk uh, and dairy products, actually started this way. So this is like a huge um, foundation uh, for the whole uh, development of Denmark, not only in, in, the, in the farming industry, but also as a thought and as a, a way of developing things together. So Denmark emerged very much from this. And then later on, after the Second World War, um, the public sector and the state saw it as their role. It was their responsibility actually to go in and build up the country and make it safe for people. Uh, that would include building schools, uh, hospitals, um, houses, uh, sports facilities. Um, so that was very much their job and their responsibility to sort of support the society with, with all these facilities and uh, uh, life quality parameters. And in that period, it's called the Golden Age. I'll just show you this. 
that's also in the 60s and the 70s, like probably a, a lot of other cities, that you get this suburban uh, outlay and uh, these new structures that are that, that are very rational. Um, but at the same time, it was also this wish that people from the city, which was very dirty and you know not enough space, that people should have the possibility to have their own home to get out in the suburban landscape and get some fresh air, some grass beneath the, you know, the, uh, the toes. And they should definitely also have good quality furniture. So we have like this golden age within uh, design in Denmark. Uh, probably you know Anna Jacobsen and Finn Juhl, who did a lot of this stuff. So, uh, and of course, everybody should have their own car. So this is also the rem reminiscence that we know today from, from the big thoughts from the suburban uh, uh, outlay, which today looks like this, and you have it, and uh, you know, all cities have this, whether it's large or small, the urban sprawl, and these suburban areas, the single family houses. So this is like, this welfare state, a lot of uh, people, and internationally, is looking towards uh, the Nordic countries to sort of learn what is actually, how, how did you do this? Um, because things are, you know, in, in many ways things have been very stable and you sort of been lifting the whole uh, society. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's some more uh, skeptical ones. I'll just read this up. Um, if you're interested in horrible places, I can recommend Denmark to you. Nobody starves. Everybody lives in small, neat houses. But nobody is rich, nobody has a chance to live in luxury, and everybody is equally depressed. <laughs> everybody lives in their small, tidy cell with their Danish furnit and their wonderful lamps without which they would go crazy. This is uh, Life Force in 2001. So that's another way to you know, look upon this welfare state. Um, and that's not the only thing. Actually, this whole welfare society right now is under big pressure, because the thing is now that this public sector who has sort of been supporting uh, the people and the development uh, no more, is not, no longer uh, capable of doing that. So we have the globalization, but also there's a large change generally uh, globally in the demographics, so people are getting older. Uh, so who's going to take care of this huge generation of elder people? And we also have a new expectation for our individual welfare. So it's not like uh, the suburban area where everybody wanted, you know, a house and a garden, and then you could just, you know, uh, fill it up. Now we, we need more individual uh, welfare cares. So the big question is how should we then continue with this welfare, and how, um, how can we collaborate and find new ways of actually providing a sustainable society, but also keeping up uh, these services and welfare services. So this is what is going on at the moment uh, in Denmark and probably also uh, somewhere else. But I think in Denmark, it's really present at the time because we simply have to change. It's not a, it's not a choice. We have to find a new way. So. What everybody is talking about and looking into is how can we co-create on this thing? How can we sort of, instead of the public sector, which used to give all these services to the civil society, how can the civil society together with the private sector also be sort of a, a, the maker of services and maybe in collaboration with the public? So it's, it's a completely new politically and also very practical structure that we're looking for. And within that, of course, this will also have a big effect on how we plan our cities and how we develop architecture and projects. So it's basically, like I said, it's on all levels. It's uh, within the ministries, the government, uh, all the municipalities, whether it's like Copenhagen municipality or it's like a small municipality out on the west coast. It's a big fund. We have a lot of funds in Denmark, especially the largest architectural fund uh, of the world is in, in Denmark. And they support a lot of, of the building environment. And citizens, they want to sort of have an impact on the surroundings. They, just, they don't want to just jump into something that 
an urban planner on some kind of, of office did. They want to be an active part of it and of course all, also the private company. So all of these stakeholders are actually interested in sort of, you know, finding a new way to collaborate on these issues. And last year we had the new, uh, we have every, not every year, but every um, government has made this uh, architecture policy. And last year we got this one, and it's actually stating the people first, that's like what it's called. So in all different kind of levels, it's describing how can we put people first when we sort of develop our architecture and, and our city. And as I said, Real Dania, this huge fund, they also work this way with the, the collective impact. So basically, this is not a question in Denmark at the moment if we should sort of engage ourselves and if we should involve the civic society. It's much more a question of how and how we plan the processes and how people can participate from project to project, also concerning urban planning. So you could say like an ideal process would be look something like this, you know, you, you have a vision and you have an investor that would sort of go for it and the municipality and decision makers are uh, involved and maybe the citizens, they have some needs that they would like to, to get fulfilled. But in real life it probably looks much more like this. And the big question is when, when everybody and even more stakeholders get involved, how can you sort of steer this process? How can you navigate and, and facilitate this? Um, it ends up being a, a question also of uh, how we plan these processes because you can basically in a process like this, you can't just, when you start, you don't know the outcome. You have to be very open and maybe have much more focus on the process and how to navigate and adjust more than we want to get to this result. So that's also a new way of thinking in, in, in this process. So what does that leave for the architect? I think very much it creates um, new premises and also a new role for the architect and urban planners to sort of work within this field. So. Um, Referring to this golden age of design in Denmark, you could say that, that the architect maybe no longer has this uh, divine uh, creativity, you know, but it's also, uh, he also has to facilitate and to involve and to make people participate while uh, designing and while developing things. And of course that demands, you know, uh, ask for new working methods as well that we have to sort of bring new tools and develop new tools that can actually open up the process and also make people sort of engage themselves and that that knowledge and those needs that people will bring into the process is actually very um, you can handle them so it's not just you know a question of I would like this and this but you can actually take it into the design process and you can work with it uh, forth and back in a dialogue. So for instance, whether it's like, you know, you have to involve people in, in a future city or a future development, what are their dreams, or you have to work with kids, you know, to take care of their local environment, um, or it could be like here, for instance, it's, it's the local stakeholders who, who are already in in the area that you maybe do an urban transformation for, how can they actually participate in that new urban design? But the good thing, because you might think, oh God, this is just, you know, it's gonna be hard work and it's just, you know. But I think the good thing is that it actually makes you hard to collaborate. <laughs> because uh, scientifically it's proven that the, our brain sort of gives you and stimulates you with this well feeling of, uh, of, uh, of happiness when, uh, when uh, collaborations are working, of course. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. So I thought I would just run through a couple of cases, sort of exemplifying how, how uh, I experience these three sectors sort of can work together on different levels within urban planning. So I will show a couple of projects from the more urbanized, dense urbanized areas, and then a couple of uh, cases from, from, this, from the outskirts.
put you some other situation again. So the first project, this one is, uh, is was a competition for the future sustainable suburb just outside Copenhagen, which we, uh, we won last year uh, in a big team with Danish and Dutch uh, urban planners. And it was a strategic development plan for this new suburb that should contain uh, 4,000 new houses and 10,000 new inhabitants. And uh, this is Copenhagen and the greater Copenhagen and it's placed out here. It's a part of, of the finger plan which uh, was made in, in 47. So you have the infrastructure and the green areas in between. So it sits just on, on the finger. So it's uh, 20 minutes to Copenhagen Central. And this is uh, the area seen from above. So this uh, it used to be an old industrial area. And then you have uh, the existing suburb surrounding it. And within that, we have to make this new developed plan. This is how it looks like in the existing suburban area. So the task was to make this sustainable suburb for 4,000 new houses, and it should include these new concepts for, for how can we work with the common within an urban area, how can we work with strategically with, with uh, creating new local communities. So the issue for us was, in this case, how do you actually make a plan that is designed to, to future residents that are not there yet, but for them to engage in. So that was part of, of the brief. Here you see the outline of uh, 65 hectares and just the existing surface, a suburb, and then you have the train station going into Copenhagen. Um, so what we basically did was to design this plan that could engage on different levels um, future stakeholders and citizens. And I don't know, but by stakeholders, I don't know how how you use that word, but in Denmark, it's like, it's all the actors and agents that could have some kind of interest in the project. So that would be like civil, public, and private um, that, that uh, has some kind of interest in, in the initiative. So basically, the, the, sustainab the, the, the <laughs> sustainable uh, suburb was very much about how can we go from this image where everybody has this single family house into which is way too space consuming we can't continue on this way we also need some more flexible housing concept because uh, the thing is out here that a lot of people they stay uh, mostly for their uh, whole life and they get older and the kids are moving away and what should they do with all these square meters so it's very inflexible also in the funding me methods and it's very monofunctional, there's not that much public life and, and urban life. So we try to combine the best of both worlds. So you have the suburban qualities with the, with the smaller scale uh, and your own house, um, smaller scale and single family houses, and combine that with the city block where you also, you're very dense, but you also have these social qualities because you interact with each other. And, and we try to Im implement this, this concept. So at, in the 60s and the 70s, you could say moving to the uh, suburban area was mo very much based on a common dream, one common dream. It was this having a single family house and a garden. Um, but today, life forms, we have much more variety in our life forms. You know, people are getting uh, divorced and they have the kids for two days and maybe there are six people the next weekend because then your girlfriend she has three kids and a dog and you know it's it's completely different today so what we actually um, uh, tried to implement was the structure of how much you actually want to participate because this should not be like you have to be part of something social you don't want to be part of it should basically be that you have the choice you have a wider panel of choices so we made this a structure. This was like the concept behind our development plan that you can either choose, you know, if you're very extreme and you want to do everything together with it, somebody else, you know, that could be your house, you build together with your friends or in a collective, or you do like gardens together, or maybe you even, concerning the welfare state, you even do a kindergarten together. 
but it could also be that you do something on your own. I want to build my own house, you know, my own garden, and I take care of my kids at home. You know, that's that's my lifestyle. Or you could just choose that somebody else does it for you, like you know, it's built, and you just buy your apartment, or you do it for rent, or you just go to the shop, or you even get it delivered at your house instead, so you don't have to get involved. So that's basically the principle. How can we make a new development plan that can actually have this variety of life forms? Uh, and make that uh, offer the offering that for the new buyers. So we ended up making this uh, concept of clusters, and basically one cluster is divided into very small um, pieces of land of plots. So if you were like a, a regular larger developer, you could buy a, a, a certain amount of these plots, but it also gave the opportunity for like a single family or maybe you know. 10 families from Copenhagen that would like to move to the suburban area, maybe to, to build something together, or you know, some row houses together, or even like uh, we have these uh, called the, the common the common houses, you know, so the government or, or the public sector could sort of build. So in this way, you would have the opportunity to sort of, you know, give a lot of people the opportunity to actually take part in this development. And each cluster would then have a parking house uh, that was combined with the garbage collect, uh, the co to collect garbage and, and uh, renewable um, systems in there. And um, another thing we tried to do was to um, to sort of make a framework for how can we work with different scales of communities. So, in order, if you you see. Well, we might have some public spaces and uh, urban, uh, public domains that sort of address itself for the whole area, say 10,000 persons. What could that be? It might be, you know, a big market. Then again, if you see it, what kind of community framework would, would work for maybe 700 to 1,000 persons within the neighborhood? It might be that you, you are together in this parking house or that you have like workshops for doing things. And even if you go down to the small scale community, which is maybe, maybe just between 10 to 20 houses, what can you actually share there? Maybe you share, you know, some chickens in the garden for the kids, or maybe even you share an extra room that when you have a guest sleeping over, they could have this, or when your teenager is moving out and just hysterical, she can get this room. So you have this kind of flexibility within the plan. And another important thing I just want to mention in order to this co-creation uh, co uh, and the collective uh, was that we proposed this new kind of urban landscape that connects the new plan with the existing across the, across the railroad road, the train. Um, and this new landscape was basically a landscape of private and public partnership as, we, uh, as, a, as a strategical tool, but also that would end up being very physical. So what we uh, proposed was to make this new uh, landscape that could connect the two parts, but still in the landscape you would have different kind of clusters. So for instance, around the railway uh, station you would have a more regional cluster where people that would sort of come to the area, for instance, it could be companies or the library, or it could be entrepreneurs, education, higher education could sit around here. And the, th the idea was that by bringing them together, they would also have an impact of, on, the, on the public life within this landscape. So maybe they even were maintaining it. It were, was so, some sort of uh, negotiated landscape that they, they could actually make and have an impact on. And that public space, when you go through that landscape, would be quite different from, for instance, over here, which is more local. Could be like elder home and the healthcare house, the school and the scout. Uh, scout. Uh, maybe even when you walk through here, you would uh, go through the, the schoolyard. It would be a public space that you could just walk through. So this was the strategy both in, in combining uh, existing and the new, but also how people could actually uh, position themselves in, in smaller uh, collaborative uh, uh, 
places. So this is just a view on how one of these clusters could look like. So you have the upcoming and new, uh, the newly built uh, houses, uh, while people are, are sort of testing something out in this in this urban landscape. Yeah, just the uh, last thing. We try also to how can we make strategy and how people can then get into this area because often these development plans, you know, they're realized within 10, 20, 30 years. So how can you actually make a city before the city is built? So this pre-city landscape, we, we make a strategy on, on how can people in the area, the existing suburban area, or maybe even uh, people that would like to buy a house, they can sort of, over the years, sort of come here and do things. So you can establish small shelters, uh, maybe school, school gardens where the existing school could go into this landscape and start to, you know, uh, grow things and use it for things um, while the development is sort of being built. And that would, of course, be, be planned with the, with, the, with the different planning plots. Just an view on how that. And the whole uh, process was very open for doing this development plan. So we had several public meetings with the citizens, the local citizens out there, so they could qualify the plan. They could tell us very much about, OK, so for instance, this idea with the pre-city landscape, they told us from the school, school leaders, we would like a place where we could go with kids and grow stuff. OK, so that's nice. So we implemented that idea. So. Uh, so we had several of those, and at the end it was all delivered, and now they're actually starting, starting to, um, to clean up the area and to, uh, to get further with the, with the development plan. Okay, let's see. Uh, have, are we still having some time? This is Musicon, and this is a, another situation. It's a development outside, a little bit further outside from Copenhagen. It was an urban renewal of a former industrial area. And uh, Copenhagen is in here. Uh, the, the future suburb is just here. And then the music is here in Roskilde, which is a large city in Copenhagen. And basically, this, uh, this urban development came from, from Roskilde Festival. Some of you might know it. It's the largest uh, music festival in, in Northern Europe. It's once a year, every uh, first week of July. And um, it's huge. It's like, I think there's 90,000 or 100,000 people coming to, to this place. It's basically just a field outside Roskilde, um, coming to gather together to listen to music, but also um, to live, to be together. It's very social. Uh, and when it's there and it's all being built, it's actually the fourth largest city in Denmark. And basically, it consists everything in the city. It has a hospital with, yeah, it has cafes, uh, places you can shop, uh, you can live, toilet, whatever, bank, insurance. So it, it is a city, but it's temporary. And it's there for a week, it has urban spaces, uh, public areas where people hang out, art installations. So the task was here, the, the festival is just down here, and you have the highway here. So the task was to sort of see how can, can the potential, there's a big potential in this temporary festival, this temporary city, how can we actually make that permanent? Not on Roskilde Festival, but somewhere else in the city. So we have a lot of knowledge on, on, on how to do things together. So the municipality bought this area uh, in 2008. It was a former uh, industrial area. And um, they said with all the stakeholders and with the festival, let's try and build a city out of this. Uh, so they bought it and they decided, I think the, the, the very important thing here is that they actually decided not to sell off quickly. So it was really like a long-term investment. And that was very important because then they didn't have to sort of you know, uh, get the money back uh, very quickly. So the area looked like this when we came there, and I was uh, I was there hired to sort of sit out on the side from day one, and we should sort of uh, implement this strategy and work together with all the stakeholders. 
It used to be a gravel pitch and then later on a, um, what do you call it, when you dump all your garbage in the, in the hole. And then on top of that, they build this concrete factory. And then we should make this uh, musical city. So the municipality, along all the political parties, they went together and said, we want to do this. And they agreed on, we shouldn't do any master plan. So there hasn't been any master plan in Malt for the last seven, eight years. But what they wanted to do, want to, they wanted to involve both public and private stakeholders that would like to be part of this urban development. And that was very much in the spirit of the Rosfield Festival. And instead they developed this uh, music on, it was a strategy and it was a set of rules and, and uh, values that we should develop the city from. And it was not a plan. And the other very important choice they made was that they chose to make a secretary a secretariat that was actually out on the site, steering and guiding the process, working with people and the stakeholders. So I was sitting here, and, and we were, I think, two, two and a half people <laughs> from, from the start. And we were sort of being this, um, uh, this device in between the stakeholders and the municipality. So we were working very close with all the different departments like traffic, culture, planning within the municipality. And at the same time, we were uh, talking and developing ideas and concepts with all the stakeholders. And um, here you see like we had a small house out there and everybody's eating together from you know, the beginning. So whenever people moved out there, we had a, a common lunch at 12 o'clock. So you see private and public and um, local citizens working there. So our task was in the secretariat was for a small amount of, of money. We should, within three years, we should make the conditions for public life before the built city. So we had the money, a small amount of money, to convert some of these big buildings into to places that you could rent for events or that you could move into for office spaces for entrepreneurs and small creative companies. Um, and we could make uh, some larger uh, events as well. And as we did that, we also had to sort of develop the strategy. So how do we do this? Um, one thing we did in the beginning was to, to make, a, we invited basically the whole building business down there together with the event makers business uh, to see how is there some kind of collaboration we can make here and who would actually be interested. Um, and, and then people started to come to us and say, ah, oh, we would like a place, and especially artists would like, you know, places to sort of bring. And they organized themselves. And within uh, a few years, they actually had a big place out there. And then we helped them sort of transforming this uh, old space into an art gallery. So we had like art galleries, uh, stages for, for dance scenes, and uh, these workshops and office spaces. And uh, one thing we, we realized very quickly is when you work with these very uh, enormous areas, you have to make some kind of wayfinding because people just got lost if there was a small event somewhere. Um, so we very quickly, we made this wayfinding so people could sort of find their way, but it also became like the new identity for the area so people could actually see something new is going on here because this used to be a closed area for, for the city even though it's like 10 minutes from the train station. So people didn't really realize that this was actually part of, of their backyard and they could use it for, for whatever. You see the art galleries. So all these cultural activities, because they they sort of you know were public and people could come and work out or learn to dance with the kids. Suddenly, this whole uh, public life was actually entering the site before we even had built anything, just by transforming these uh, former industrial. Some of them we didn't have money for all of them, but just some of them. Transforming them would make facilities that these people and activities could, could actually take place. We had a huge skater, skater space. And you see, it's, it's not beautiful, but I mean, it's not architecturally you know, well designed, but it's functional and we could use it for something, art installations. So 
again, if, if the municipality had chosen or the client had chosen to make it the other way around to sort of sell off a lot of building plots and starting to let people build, we would never have had all this uh, public life. So that was basically, I think, the, a, a clever decision for them to make. And one thing we had to do was to clean up very much. Uh, and uh, while we did that, we realized that there was a whole area we couldn't use for, I think, 50 years. And at the same time, we had to do a lot of water management uh, because there's a lot of rain in Denmark that doesn't go into the sewage anymore. It's a really huge problem. So combining this te technical um, thing with recreation, um, we formed this project, which is really nice now because it's creating a lot of public life. So this is basically uh, a water management system. So when there's a huge waterfall, it's only like every fifth or 10 years, the water can go in this, but uh, the rest of the time, like four years <laughs> in between, people can skate and use it for recreation. So this will be filled up with water maybe every 10th year. And that's what it takes now in Denmark due to this water. But at the same time, if you can actually combine it with, with this recreational uh, thing, it's, uh, it's quite good. So just to show you the last one, the last project which is actually being realized now is the Danish Rock Museum. It was a huge competition, uh, I think, two years ago. And it's won by MVRDV and the Danish Corpus. Um, it's the Danish Rock Museum, and then it's the headquarter of the festival, the Rock Street Festival, and the new uh, high school for, for students. And they just uh, they went in ground a couple of months ago, and here you see a glimpse of the, the golden facade and our culture minister, <laughs> just there for the opening. Okay, so I will just, the, the, the rest of, of the cases are, are not so substantial, but I will just also, I think it's important also to show how we can work with, with the co-creative processes in the outskirts as well, where you don't have the same kind of uh, economy and the same kind of uh, 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 decision making. So this project uh, was a project uh, we did last fall um, in Valsø, and it's just outside Musikon as well. Um, basically, this I, I took this with me because it's a it's a um, analyze from the Ministry of of Urban Planning that says that uh, you might as well uh, delete some of these villages because everybody is leaving anyway. So that's one way you could sort of go. I think another way you could go and, and, and try to grasp or try to, to do something uh, is what we did in Valsu, which was actually a, a, a funny starting point because um, the, the urban planning department, they hadn't done any urban planning here for years. And at the end, the citizens were really getting tired. And they were just like, OK, we just do it ourselves. They were very proactive and, and really well concerned. So they just started sending uh, suggestions to the municipality and they, in the end they had to do something. So then when we came in, basically what we did, because this is a general um, challenge, like shops are closing down and the main street looking really like shit. So what should they do? And they, they actually cared about the city. They wanted to stay there, but it was really you know a lack of uh, muni municipal uh, will to sort of do something. So we made a strategy of how all these local resources and the, the, this very proactive um, initiatives, how they could sort of uh, start to work with them. So it didn't get like an opposition out in, in the city. And the mayor then invited all the citizens uh, in to the process and said, OK, now we make a framework for you guys, so now you can actually work together with our planners in developing our city. So this is very much uh, uh, a project about making a platform, a physical place, where people could actually meet and start 
on developing the local community. So what we did, we found uh, the former local bank, which was also closed down, and um, we rented for a year, and for very little amount of money, we refurbished that former bank into a project office, which was actually the, um, the citizens' project office, so they have the key. And then two days a week, the municipal uh, or the, the urban planners, it's a small core group, they come here and work together with the, with the citizens. So this is how it looked like. And then um, within three weeks, we had sort of set it up so we could work with it. We had made a big model and a new graphic and yeah, uh, cheap IKEA stuff in there. But it, it looked really nice and it worked very well. And it was a very visible statement from the municipality that, you know, this is actually a place now, this is yours. And the public was, you know, taking it and they saw it as there. So they're having like kids' birthday and, you know, they can use it for basically everything. Um, and from there, now they're just working on different kind of ideas and strategies. Another case on, on the outskirt is uh, this the national people meeting, which has turned really, really big in Denmark within the last five years. It's uh, a political festival, and it's uh, on Bornholm, which is like an island far, far away, <laughs> uh, close to Sweden. It's actually over here. And this is Denmark, this is Sweden. Uh, it's a beautiful island. It's very uncommon for the Danish landscape. It's, uh, very, there's a lot of rocks and uh, castles and crazy church like this beautiful one. Um, and on the east coast of the island is a small village called Ellinge. And it's the same, same problematic, like people are moving away. And, uh, but people are, the people li living there are happy to live there. It's very romantic and um, they have like really old, beautiful, well refurbished houses, small harbors, but also, you know, houses for sale, which is like a, a common thing for areas like this. But then every once a year in June, there's this political meeting, the people's meeting going on, and that will bring 90,000 people over four days to this small village, which I think is normally inhabited by one and a half thousand people. So it's like really dramatically changed. Um, and it has now like gone on for four years. And it's like, if you're not there, you have, you know, you can come to Denmark because the rest of Denmark is just empty because everybody is going there. So it's like all the political parties, all organizations, you know, everybody just go there. And in the beginning, the first couple of years, you know, people had to go to bed you know, not starving, but they were hungry because there was simply not enough food. It caused a lot of logistic um, problems because all you couldn't get a, 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 a ticket on the ferry, you couldn't get home, you couldn't get a place to stay because normally this small society is simply not capable of, of uh, grasping so, so huge an amount of people. So. The people's meeting is basically about creating a framework for meetings between the decision makers and the business interest group and citizens. So it's, it's really creating this platform where people can discuss. So for instance, our prime minister go there and you can just have a chat with her and discuss things. So it's, it's very much about also getting the citizens to understand how the, the society works, but also to invite them in um, in making new policies. Here, for instance, you see our prime minister, and it's a machete bringing the, I don't know, ketchup for her or something like that. So here you just see this small village, how it's like completely packed with people. And uh, within this urban uh, area or this small village, there's also these more temporary structures uh, they have got this uh, uh, this uh, house or whatever it's called a dome, which then can uh, contain some of these uh, dialogue and and, um, and meetings. But at the rest of the year, it seems like it's just empty. So, what is happening now is actually that um, 
uh, there will be a, a competition, architectural competition, because there's a huge potential in, in this festival. And what, how can this huge event, huge festival, in the democratic uh, processes, how can that actually uh, be part of lifting a small uh, village and the village development? So what we're doing now, I'm involved in, in making the brief for a competition for, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, development plan, and it will start soon. Uh, and it's going to be really, really interesting to see how we can come up with, uh, with new solutions. Because the problem is here that you have a lot of people doing one week, you make structures, temporary structures, and how can they actually be implemented and have a function for the rest of the year? So we have to work very much on, on transforming cities that are actually capable of scaling up and scaling down through a year uh, and still have a value when, when people have gone and all the tents are down. Um, so it's really an interesting, I think, urban design competition of new topologies that can be implemented in the, in the urban fabric. And the last one, I think I, I will just really like to show you because I think that's like a best case in how how uh, small communities uh, can be really, really in, innovative. And this is on another um, island in Denmark. It's called Samsung and um, it's out here. And uh, the task was here that or, or the, the story was that in, in 97, the, the former minister, minister of Environment, he put out a, a, a call for small islands that could actually uh, uh, be self-sufficient in, in energy, and they would have 10 years to do that. And Samsu was an island that applied for that, uh, and uh, they, got, they got the call, they got the assignment. And it's again a small, very uh, romantic, very uh, nice landscape. Um, island and what was really important here was in order to, to realize this huge task uh, the minister and, uh, and knew that you, I mean it was a very top down decision who, who can actually do this but it was also a very clever decision to say well it's not like the government who should implement it if this has to be realized, we really need the local community to take ownership to this process and to actually be the one who carries it through. So the first thing they did was to get a lot of public support, uh, to get all the people living on the island activated in, and also telling what is actually the potential of, of, of doing this. How can we get self-sufficient in, in, uh, in green energy? And uh, what they actually came, they realized this project within 10 years. So they have a lot of uh, windmills, both on land and offshore, huge windmills. Some of them are owned by you know, a local farmer. But in order for a local farmer to put off, up his own windmill, he had to give off land for all citizens who didn't own any land and uh, who only uh, paid a share. So for instance, some of the windmills are maybe owned by 400 citizens and another one by a farmer and the last one by the, uh, by the, by the state and so forth. Um, it's a huge project and I just think it's very inspiring when you see those huge structures that it, this is not a national project. It's actually local citizens that can look out and say, oh, my windmill is producing energy today. Um, which really shows like they got on this idea because they were involved and they took ownership and they didn't have to pay that much because again this um, uh, cooperative uh, thinking was really embedded in this project and they have these um, uh, heating centrals uh, on their own produced um, stocks and I think a learning from this was that very clever move was that they got CERN, uh, Hermansen, who's now, uh, he was in charge of the project. He's a local farmer. So they needed, they knew they needed somebody on the island to sort of, you know, take this further. So they contacted CERN and said, what do you think of this? And he thought of the idea, he could see the potential for the whole island. island. So he went 
and you know collect people and had all these meetings and slowly you're convincing people this would be a good idea and what does it take because it sounds like you know humongous if you just like I'm not supposed to ask the owner a windmill so he did a tremendous job and I think it's very much a lesson in this leadership local leadership uh, that is very important in order to to co-create on on big projects like this and uh, today they have this uh, energy academy it's called and you know basically it's quite funny because it's not they're not that well known in Denmark but they are, it's a world best case so they have after the tsunami in Japan they had like delegation from the ministry over there coming to to learn about how can you actually implement locally uh, green energy so they have a lot of lessons and, uh, and education and uh, workshops within this small uh, energy academy and a lot of artists also there and I think I will just end off with 15 minutes because I think actually they had a visit uh, from an amb ambassador I don't know from where and they collected uh, around they gathered around the, the small pond so um, yeah I think that's it for now <laughs> so I don't think I have any no That's okay. Can we have some questions and answers? Oh. Is that all right? Can I? Yeah, love to. We were going to try out this kind of yeah. me interview you a little bit okay. routine and then involve the audience as well. Is that okay? That would be great. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Anna Thank Katrina, you. for the lecture. You're welcome. For those in the audience who don't know me, I'm Anthony Burke, head of the School of Architecture. Nice to meet you all. Um, Anne-Catherine, thank, yeah, thanks for the lecture. There, it raises so many interesting questions uh, for us in terms of what we're going through in Sydney right now. Mm. And um, the idea of how do we define the public, how do we work with publics at different scales. One of the things that is particularly resonant with what you've just shown us is that the grassroots sort of proactive citizen is great at a certain scale, but once you get past 4,000 houses or 10,000 citizens, what happens when you get to you know, five and a half million people in the Sydney mm. Basin sort of thing. Mm. So there are some really interesting questions about this process and its scalability, if you like, across a very larger democratised mm. planning process. But I want to ask, the first question I want to ask you is, we, we always borrow from Denmark, where we love, you know, getting, you know, ideas about the city from Danes, from young girl and from people like yourself. What do you think you've learned in your time here in Sydney that you'll take back to Denmark? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> An anything at all? Anything? Anything. Just okay. <laughs> the good food? No. Um, no, but I think we had this discussion about the, the big differences in, in the private sector and the public sector, which is obviously, you know, the private sector is, has such a big power and impact here compared to Denmark. So in, in some way, I think um, these processes, of course, uh, you can't just, you know, the way of working in Denmark where you have this sort of common, you know, you might have different opinions, but you still have some sort of common, you know, thought about how the city should be developed or uh, socially. Um, I think you can't just take that down here. Uh, but again, I think there's some lessons to, to know because what I didn't really show that much was the, the private sector in these projects because they're sort of, they're coming in after this, you know, after the public and after the civil sort of public life. Um, I mean, we, we do things in reverse here, right? We, yeah, we start with we, the economic model first yeah. and the four part, uh, you know, um, urban growth strategy yeah. for the Bayes precinct and yeah. others is get the economic model right, yeah. then work out the feasibility and test it against different experts, then step three, only mm. step three out of four steps, do you involve design yeah. or architects or anything like something mm. like a proposition. Mm. And then four, look at what you've done and then reflect on it and see how you could do it better. Mm. So we're almost the antithesis mm. of the process that you're mm. setting up. What do you, I mean, how do you, how do you respond to that? Recognising that scale change, but yeah. how do you come at that? 
No, but I think the interesting here is actually the scaling, like you say. So I haven't got the solution, but it's like it, it would damn. be yeah, damn. it would be <laughs> it would be really interesting, for instance, to see like now the forthcoming urban areas here in Sydney that you're starting on now, for instance, with the base precinct, and you also have the Bangaroo, and uh, this scale. When you then think, okay, how would you actually do something similar, or maybe not similar, but how would you actually invite or make it a more open process? Um, it's really interesting, I mean, to, to sort of think about how can you set the structure for that, and I guess that's also what you mm. sort of ask. Yeah, generally the public seems to sort of come last as a sort of like a value add. You yeah. can put the cherry on top yeah. if you can get the cooking classes to happen on yeah. a Saturday morning down yeah. at the fish markets. But yeah. actually, all the money goes into the residential development, which supports the rest yeah. of that, you know. That's but how it seems to work here. But I think, for instance, there has been a change recently about these things in Denmark, because for 10 years ago, it was more like, okay, okay we involve or we invite the citizens in just so you, we can hear the questions and then we can, you know, sort of uh, uh, say, well, we did ask, you know, and we had this meeting and then we go back to normal business and we do as we used to do. So, so then, and then we just stepped up, we maybe had two meetings or three citizen meetings, but the process was, it was the same and the planners and the decision makers kept on working in the same way and the result probably was the same. Mm -hmm. But it was much more of a legalizing uh, question saying we actually did, you know, involve. But now it has changed that I think people in all the sectors, especially in the public and the civic, have, have realized that, uh, that people are urban currency. Like it's, I mean, if, if, if you don't work with them, if you don't um, sort of invite them in, if they don't have a space, if they don't have any impact of the, on their surroundings, you know, it, it's not going to be a, a nice environment to mm. live in. And, so and for instance, we also have had in, for instance, in Copenhagen, we still have those built harbor areas that was, you know, the first to be developed. Mm. And I think we, we discussed this as well. We have one especially that we always tend to look at and say, oh, we shouldn't do like that. Probably it's like the same with that Rangaroo, I guess, <laughs> here. <laughs> and. Um, it's there and, and, and you can always look at, okay, what went actually wrong? Um, but I think now you, you really know that the place where people want to live is also the, the places where, where you have this public life where you can interact. And, uh, and you don't have that if you just have these really uh, high profile, expensive apartments uh, down to the waterfront because it has this kind of gated society and there's nothing going on there and you can't really you can feel I'm not, I'm not welcome here. You know, I'm I'm not invited in. I there's probably not even a, a bench or anything you can sit on. Mm. So, so I guess one one question then that follows on from that is if you've got different scales of public, and we talk about the public as though it's some kind of understood ubiquitous idea from Denmark to Sydney and mm. presumably to Tokyo. Yeah. So yeah, we just say public, and everyone thinks, oh, that's a very nice you know, yeah. notion. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. But actually, we're talking about radically different publics. Yeah. Like if I think about a Danish public, as you've described, one where small groups of people seem to be quite able to be socially committed to different sorts of actions, to get involved, even to come out and have a planning meeting, where I keep thinking, actually, in Sydney, how would we train a public? Mm. to be perhaps more involved like that. I mean, when something like the casino at Barangaroo was announced, there was an outcry in the papers, but all things said and done, actually very minimal sort of uh, pushback on that from, a pub from the public, if you like. Mm. So there's either a very big distance or gulf about where the public feels it can interact mm. with those sorts of processes which are just behind the curtain and never seen, or there's a different sort of idea of what the public is mm. in Sydney, for mm. example. Do you think there's a difference in, yeah, but in I, how I do you train a public? No, but I think also, again, uh, it's a scale question because we're a small country, like five million people. So I think we're very used to this close, you're, you're very close to the democracy, to the decision makers. It's not like something, you know, up there in another world. Or there's a, you know, and, and the politicians, they also know, especially in the municipality, the local uh, elected, you know, they really have to be, you know, 
out on the street and, and uh, engaged and in dialogue. So I think we have this tradition that mm. and maybe it's again this uh, collective uh, uh, tradition with the, with the diaries. I mean, this notion that if we, if we come together, if we join forces, we can actually have an impact. And I think uh, maybe in that way, it's even stronger in the States, I think, with mm. all those grassroots. Uh, but they have another way of financing things, of course. Speaking of finance, that's going right <laughs> to my next question. I mean, I know you, you, you mentioned Reldania mm. and, uh, as, a, as a public fund that's set up specifically for supporting the built environment and the public dimensions of the built environment. Um, that seems to be absolutely fundamental to making these types of initiatives actually fly. I mean, there has to be a source of the money, mm. and we don't have those sorts of funds here. How, does, how central is Reldania to this type of initiative? Is, would it fail without Reldania? Put it that way. Mm. No, I don't think it would fail. I think actually, I think some of these projects I've shown, you know, they have had a great impact. And, mm without the, the huge amount of money. For instance, the one in Samsung, I think, is so, and he, he wasn't well paid, you know, only to, to be there for two days, uh, working and, 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 you know, getting the whole community together. So, and Real Daniel was not part of that project. So, no, they're just a big player, mm -hmm. and, and they do really uh, nice initiatives, and they're very much in front of this collective uh, impact uh, on other issues as well. So, for instance, they're very, um, very much involved in also how we, how do we do, do deal with the rural areas, mm. the rural countryside. How can we sort of uh, compromise the use of it, both for farming but also for recreational use? Mm. So, it's very much on a structural level, and they are also, of course, uh, um, uh, building a lot. Where, where actually did Real Dania come from? I mean, it was a, some sort of superannuation type fund, wasn't it? No, it's actually, in, in some way, it's a, the, it's, a, it's a people's money because it came, it came um, from, what do you call this mortgage when you take a, a loan in your house? Mm -hmm. uh, the mortgage industry? Yeah, so, so you, you borrow this money. Uh -huh. So it's a mortgage lender? Yeah, in, in a way. And, and uh, during, uh, for instance, for over a hundred years, the, the sort of the, the fortune just went really huge. And uh, at a certain point, there was something about they had to, to sort of uh, restructure, and they couldn't they couldn't give back the money, you know, to people in, within the last hundred years. So actually, that's why their sort of their approaches, they are sort of giving this back to the people by the built environment by investing in that. So it is, yeah. It's a, it's a, terrible, it's a really unique, it's unique. situation, yeah. yeah. It is, it one is. that I wonder if we'd be even able yeah. to emulate anyway. I don't anyway. know how to set that off. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you set one, one of those up for us, please? Yeah. That'd be awesome. But I, but I think, just Anthony, I think this, this, this can easily, I mean, happen. You, you see it in, in other fields as well, where people just gather. If they have an idea, they find a way of, you know, funding it or, or bringing it to life. So mm. I think it's very much about believing in, 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 in an idea and that you have the right leaders, you know, like CERN, for instance, who mm. can actually make people follow. You, you, need, a, you, need, you need people to follow and you need, um, especially these first followers are quite important when, yeah. when you sort of come up with something. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. I enjoyed that so much. It was incredibly interesting. And I wonder whether this issue of finance doesn't come down to this uh, superannuation. I mean, we have one of the largest superannuation funds in the world, and it's hard to believe that we can't make an argument for the way that we use it in, in better ways, right? Which brings me to the question of legitimacy. It seems that one of the things that, that has been done so well through all of these projects is the grounds on which uh, Danish society is claiming legitimacy for these projects. And I wonder. I think this may be coming back to Anthony's question of, about scale, but I wonder whether um, I wanted to know whether you pushed it against any large infrastructure projects that mm. demand 
the taking of things from the few to benefit the many? Because it seems mm. to me at the moment the projects we're looking at are really about sort of value adding mostly or mm. greenfield sites or you know brownfield sites. Yeah. Um, they're not about having to actually take land from people to provide mm. new transport infrastructure or mm. to you know do new hospitals yeah, or things like that. Not, not that I know of, I'm sorry, but uh, it's, I, I think especially on the infrastructure that's probably <coughs> still to come. Yeah. I guess it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very technical and um, yeah, it, it's, I mean at the moment in Copenhagen there's uh, a lot of infrastructural projects going on. Uh, for instance, they're building the new metro, the last part of it in the inner, inner city. And um, I'm not sure of it, but I don't think there has been that much uh, participation. I think it's very much about, you know, also communication and how to sort of, you know, we know this will be a pain in the ass for the next five years for people living there. And how can we sort, sort of, you know, make it as little trouble as possible. They made like, um, a wall around the, the metro uh, sites yeah. where public art and you can sort of you know use it for some so it sort of gives something back to the to the public uh, areas and, and the urban spaces but uh, not uh, I don't know of really like hardcore infrastructure that are done in co-creative processes I think. any questions from the yeah thanks uh, thanks for the presentation. I, I really enjoyed it too. I'm a town planner, and um, I'm uh, uh, I'm glad that you described this this important shift that I think is happening away from the state providing public assets and facilities to individuals gathering together mm. to provide those things. And I think that's an important shift, um, a decentralisation and a relocalisation shift that's happening. Uh, and I think the internet is enabling a lot of that to happen as well. Uh, certainly. Uh, Denmark and the Northern European countries are far ahead of us in terms of cooperative housing, which you've been doing for 100 years, mm. and, uh, and a lot of those co uh, cooperative arrangements that you're now scaling up to residential scale, and we haven't really latched onto mm. at the housing, housing scale. But there are other cooperative arrangements, and you talk about the idea of public. The public is not this amorphous mass or the public authority, it's actually people working together mm. to provide things and providing housing is one thing, but there's also, and UTS is leading the way here in Australia in terms of community renewable energy, mm. as communities getting together to provide yeah. their own energy as you described at the end. Uh, and there's also shifts in terms of uh, local food production, mm. uh, permaculture, uh, food okay. cycle management. Uh, and also water cycle management, so uh, cities as water catchments. So there's a lot of those ideas that are sort of happening all separately. And uh, I wonder uh, when you're thinking about sustainable suburbs, whether you think about pulling all those things together into mm. one community that provides all those, um, you know, water, food, energy, shared spaces, shared mm. assets, all of those things, because that to me would be a public city where, where the public yeah. is involved. Yeah, I mean, we, we had to address on all these, you know, things that you've come up with themes. I didn't tell about all of them, but there was a huge water management structure within this infrastructure and, and also for public transportation and food production, but still on a very schematic level. So it was basically about describing for the client what kind of framework they should focus on in order to make this possible in case you know some people come I mean it's not like the clients should provide everything but they should sort of say okay if you have this idea you can actually go and realize it over here or if you you, you, you want to do this you want to build everything yourself or make a new school maybe do it down here or you know or we will help you with this and this or we can connect you with you know, these uh, stakeholders that we already, you know. So it was very much about sort of for us in this proposal to, to uh, show how they can actually make a suburb that could address for, for, uh, for different needs more than just the traditional need of a house, a garden, my car, you know, and uh, sports facilities and, you know, this is where I go and shop. 
So how you could bring that into into the this new development plan. At the same time, it was a task that we didn't um, that this new development shouldn't you know have everything. It was it needed all also in order to be um, sustainable. That for instance. By bringing in new shops, we would probably close everything down in the existing main, main street, which was already closing down. So we really had to be really uh, um, delicate, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, to find a, a good way of balancing so we didn't make a, a city that was sort of just enclosed and, and closing uh, around its own uh, self sufficient um, Yeah. I, I think one of the difficulties, if I can just have one more question, uh, it's not really a question, it's more a statement, that uh, like we start with a block of land that's been, you know, it was an industrial estate that's been demolished, go and fix it. So we start with a defined parcel rather than, uh, and the water sensitive cities people, cities as water catchments mm. people talk about thinking of the city as the catchment, the water catchment, because you start building a city around the water. So if you manage the water supply first, then everything else can sort of work around that in terms mm. of where you have your, your, your farming or where you have your other activities. So mm. I think we think about cities as kind of an established thing with fixed yeah. parcels and, and that's part of the problem that we have to kind of release ourselves from the existing legal structure. Mm. But for instance in this we, we work very closely with an engineer firm called Orbicon that does a lot of water management and they implemented this uh, uh, structure that you can actually, for instance, in those clusters, you can adjust uh, how you want to use the water, the water collection, for instance, for car wash or, you know, so that, that, um, that there's a lot of, um, they worked a lot on, on this and have different cases on how, you know, kids can sort of, you know, uh, redesign the water if they want to use it somewhere else. So it's basically about, like you say, integrating this system from the beginning and then people can form their the life forms around that. Um, I want to ask you about design competitions. Your Ross Kilda project, in a way, put in stark contrast the long organic process where you sat on site and you yeah. negotiated between the city and the people, and of course their voices could be heard. And then at some point, Kobe and MVRDV and all their competitors design a project, which of course comes preformed, and the yeah. competitions system precludes the ability for community consultation. So how do you judge or what's the balance between the benefits of getting in a whole bunch of voices, having a much more inclusive uh, access to the design community where for young designers, of course, we love competitions. On the one hand and on the other hand, there's no way in hell every competition team can talk to all the people on the ground. So it's impossible to have a co-creation of a design competition scheme. Yeah, but yeah, I, well, the thing is, I didn't tell about this, but but the um, the rock museum was actually um, they were out on the on the site from the day one, so they were my colleagues, the small secretary. So they had been part of Musicon, starting to develop the concept, you know, finding fundings and and um, at the end doing this competition brief, but. During that process, they have been working closely with all the other stakeholders on the site. So for instance, a major part of the project which I was uh, involved in, in developing with, with the Rock Museum was that you have these different, uh, three different uh, builders, like the festival and the Rock Museum and the high school. But they would like to share like a more public, um, common um, house for users in the city, uh, in, in the city area which was also being um, uh, public, or you could say that the other stakeholders, for instance, a small dance theater or a, a small, uh, you know, uh, this uh, creative workshop, they could move into to that place. I don't know what you call it. It's like a, a citizen's house. That would be part of this whole structure. So they were very, uh, of course, you couldn't sort of uh, have your hands on the exhibitions and sort of say, okay, I would like something else. But part of the project was actually uh, to, to give really wide frames and inviting the rest of the, the, the area into that. And how could they sort of use like the scene, the, the restaurant, the, the, the cinemas and, you know, 
so you could either rent it or you could sort of be part of maintaining it. So, but that was a difficult part to finance because how do you actually build that when, when you had different uh, builders that would di build their part in different periods whenever they got it financed. So this public part was it's really difficult to sort of finance and, and uh, who, would be the, who would maintain it also. I don't know if it was a question, but, but I, I think basically they did a lot of research and talk on how, because they didn't want an enclosed rock museum. They wanted to be part of the, of, of the whole musical. So basically it was on the client side and the writing of the brief involved the community, then you went out. So if I understand correctly, you, the community was involved in the writing of the brief of the competition. No, not in the brief, but I would say the, the years before the brief, uh, it was not like you know, it was not like a, a building client coming from the outside, not knowing Roskilde, not being part of Musicom, that just said, okay, we want to build here. They were actually, they were even there before Musicom, trying to get this project. So the whole idea and the whole concept of how they would like to work and be part of an urban area uh, came from the festival. So I think in that way, I think, of course, they didn't sort of, you can say, they have been involving, you know, experts and, and you know, rock people <laughs> from the outside, but combining that knowledge and tho those needs with the local needs as well. And then you could say the brief itself was like a more, traditional invited international competition and but basically everybody could apply for that. It, I think it's a great question because it does cut to this sort of shift from the plan to the process mm. and it gets then back to the economics of the equation which is how you get someone to invest in a process with an open end mm. when everything about the business aspects of that mm. is that security mm. in the investment that's mm. going on at the outset of the project. Mm. So it's, a, it's an interesting one to navigate yes. and one that I've I'm but very it, curious I guess about it's here. It's much more easy when it when when the client is public, you know, because uh, they in this case they they should have their investment back in 30 years. Normally, you probably won't work with a developer who would sort of say that's okay. Let's see what happens. Um, so I, I think in terms of, of doing this, it's probably much more easy in a climate like the Danish because the clients are open public public sector. I'm going to have the last, indulge myself for the last question. When you described your practice at the very beginning of the lecture, we had filmmakers and graphic designers and strategic communications people and so on. What is it then about being an architect in that constellation of people that is perhaps the, the biggest asset that you bring to that group? How, that I bring. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a new yeah. form of practice in a way, and I'm just yeah. c curious about how you sort of I, you know, characterize the skills of the architect in that new practice sort yeah. of constellation. Yeah, you know, we, we, we don't actually draw plans. Uh, I never did that, but I think my my role is is um, understanding how a city works, and uh, I ha and also facilitating basically bringing people in, their needs, their ideas, I can see how that can be worked into concepts. I can work on the concepts, I can bring that back, getting them qualified by stakeholders, citizens, whatever, and so forth and back. And the other skill, skills and professional skills, they sort of, you know, we use that either to visualize, to communicate, to sort of think into aspects of the concepts. But I would be like the, the overall you know, collecting these uh, things and making sure that it's actually, you know, addressed also to the client in the right way, the, the public or the private. So, um, but, but it's really, for me, it's also a great help, you know, I, I don't need to, you, we all know how long it takes, you know, to do things nice and neatly and visualizing and, you know, so having people who can actually do that and I can sort of concentrate on on talking and developing ideas and, and concepts, it's, it's nice. Sounds like heaven. Yeah, almost. <laughs> All right. Almost heaven. <laughs> well, I, that's, that's been a great talk. It's been a long yeah. talk too, and we, yeah. we're very appreciative of you coming and visiting us and giving nice us a lecture. Thank you very much, Anna-Katrine. <laughs>